What is going on everyone? Welcome back. Today we're going to go over some pros and cons of this 2008 Land Rover LR3. Why own an LR3? Some of my personal thoughts on the vehicle as well as uh, some, some strong suits. Some of the modifications that I've done so far and kind of what the overall picture of this uh, LR3 is for me and you know my journey with it so far. So hang tight and let's get right into it. All right, now one of the first reasons why I chose the Land Rover LR3 was the design language. Look at this thing. This thing is absolutely gorgeous. Now, don't mind some of the, you know, bumps and scrapes and stuff like that, but look at this thing. I mean, it truly is a good looking vehicle, and especially from 2008. Blocky looking SUVs will always be good looking SUVs in my book. And we see that now. We see, you know, the Land Rover Defender, um, you know, 110, you know, 130. Um, we see the new Lexus GX that's coming out. We're seeing this trend kind of of newer vehicles going back to some of the older design language when they were a little bit more blocky. But I mean, look at this thing. This thing, this thing is a beaut. It's a beast, you know, uh, all in one. It's the beauty and it's the beast. So, um, this is a 2008 model Land Rover LR3. This uh, thing has over 200,000 miles on it. I bought it with just about uh, 160 on the clock when I first picked it up. And it has been dead reliable. Now you may get some of the people that say, you know, Land Rover is unreliable. They're, you know, they're not good vehicles to own and et cetera, et cetera. Well, when you're putting that in the light of like a Toyota 4Runner, that's true. This is not going to be as reliable as your Toyota 4Runner is. However, this vehicle has been surprisingly reliable. I've been able to take this thing back and forth to the mountains, trips to the cities, you know, trips here and there. I've, I've put on about 50,000 miles on this thing in two years of ownership. So, and it's been fairly reliable. Now, some of the things that I have had to fix with the LR3 is the suspension. I did have to replace the, the compressor I had to replace some of the uh, modules, the front modules, the front air crosslink bar, which you know basically provides air from the compressor to the left and right shock. I did opt to keep the air suspension. This was something you know that I really like the air suspension. It's something that I want to keep. It's it's you know if anything goes wrong in the future, now that I've replaced all the components, I will definitely go struts and springs. Uh, just due to how pricey it was to replace uh, the four shocks, the compressor, the front crosslink bar, some of the lines and stuff like that, um, the dryer and, and reservoir, you know, just, you know, to name a few parts, uh, if not most of them for this thing. So um, that was one of the big, you know, expenses. Now we did have a few other odds and ends the transmission pan was leaking so i opted to upgrade the transmission pan to a removable filter i got the kit from lucky eight uh, it came with all the transmission fluid i needed and i did it right here in the garage so it was not too hard um, it is a pain in the butt but it's not too hard to get this done uh, that being said uh, after that was all said and done there are some little nuances that i didn't know about the uh, LR3, you know, metal transmission pan upgrade. And that was, you're upgrading to this metal pan, you have to put washers on the bolts or else the bolts will bottom out and they will snap. I had two that snap that I had to extract and it was a little bit of a nightmare just because of how cramped the spacing is in there. And uh, I, I'll tell you what, there was no information out there on on that subject that you do have to put washers on there they or else they will bottom out and then you'll be in for a world of hurt um, i did opt to go with new bolts for the pan as well and what i found was the new bolts from zf were actually not as strong as the oem bolts so then i cleaned the old oem bolts off in my sonic cleaner and i went ahead and installed the bolts um, back into the vehicle um, after kind of threading a few in and seeing that, you know, they're not that great. So that was a little bit of extra time that went into that. The next thing that we had done on this is the oil cooler seal that had to be replaced. 
Um, the oil cooler seal was something, you know, not too hard, just a few bolts. It's bolted right in the front of the engine. Uh, nothing too, too tough. Uh, the next thing was I went ahead and got this mesh style grill. This one came from Amazon. You can get them from eBay and all, you know, a bunch of stuff. Uh, there are people that complain about stuff like this. Like this doesn't like to fasten in as much as it's supposed to. Um, it doesn't really rattle around or anything like that. And it's not too bad. It's definitely fastened uh, up top and stuff like that. So that doesn't really bother me. And I enjoy the look over the OEM uh, grill there. The next thing that I had installed uh, was the snorkel. Um, I do do some light trail duty with this thing. This is, you know, not a off-roader. This is, this LR3, they're not meant for, for rock crawling. Now, don't get me wrong. You can absolutely crawl with these things. You can to an extent, um, but that's not what these are made for. These LR3s are not meant to be rock crawlers. They're meant to be vehicles that you take off-road some light trails some small rocks and stuff like that mainly overlanding that's that's the main thing that you know you're going to focus on when owning an lr3 now if you want a vehicle that's a rock crawler and something that you know is also going to be uh you know reliable you're going to be able to take it up to the mountains rock crawl and drive it back you're probably looking at more of like a really really deeply built suburban or maybe a sequoia um, you know, at least something that seats uh, the amount of people that I needed it for, um, you know, when I'm trying to stick to this segment of SUV, because of course you can go with, you know, your Forerunner, your Tacoma, um, crew cab and stuff like that. But being that I have four kids, I needed the extra seats in the back. So this has, you know, uh, three rows, you got your front rows, your captain chairs, you know, your, your mid row here. And then you've got seats back here as well that fold down and whatnot uh, to give you the extra cargo space that you need. Now, some of the personal vendettas that I have with the LR3 is the gas mileage. Now you might say, hey, you bought a V8, uh suv what did you expect well i didn't expect 10 miles or nine miles per gallon um, i did put 32s on this now these aren't 33s these are 32s this is a fairly small tire um, bigger than the factory of course and then the um the lucky eight wheels i forgot exactly what they're called but i also got those from lucky eight um you know nexon nexon tires on this one we went with 275 65 18s uh, versus the 19s that came on the HSE. Uh, but yeah, this thing, this thing gets terrible gas mileage. We're talking nine, 10 miles per gallon on the highway. And in the city, I don't even know something, something, you know, seven miles per gallon or something like that. It's pretty, pretty terrible. Um, but luckily I don't, I daily drive it, but I don't go very far, uh, every day in this thing, you know, we only take it on trips every weekend or every other weekend or something like that. So, um, outside of that, this, uh, thing is amazing. So, uh, that being one of my personal vendettas, the other one, um, I'm going to kind of reverse stance here. I'm going to say that the air suspension is kind of a pain in the butt. It is something that, you know, you've always got that worry in the back of your mind that something's going to go wrong. I did install, um, as well as the new air suspension, the, uh, lucky eight, uh, bump stop extenders are on this vehicle as well. Now the bump stop extenders gave me that little bit more peace of mind that I needed, uh, to take this thing kind of wherever I wanted it. So that being the case, I've got the bump stop extenders on there. I've got the Johnson lift rods on it. I've got, you know, kind of everything that you need for like, you know, your mild built, um, you know, or at least your mild overland, you know, slight off-roader family hauler here. Like this is to me the pinnacle of, of like a budget um, overland, you know, camping SUV right here. And what do I mean by budget? I mean that when I pick this thing up, this thing was posted for $7,500 and I picked it up for $4,500. There is still issues that I'm working with uh, that pertain to that price point, namely the fact that the rear windows 
do not go down and I figured the problem out with that so the rear windows don't go down it needs a new um, uh, module but the module is integrated into the fuse box under the hood of the vehicle and that was just a shame that was something that you know I'm like you know what these things are expensive it ties into the harness all this other stuff what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna work in a bypass uh, to the motor for the rear windows uh, to the master switch only um, or maybe do individual I'm not 100% sure on that just yet I really just mainly want it for the master switch because mainly the kids back there um, to get these windows to work and then you know after that's all said and done then you know all the other issues that were present at the time of purchasing the vehicle will be dealt with um, but yeah this was a steal at that price so to go into a little bit of backstory, when I initially started looking for a vehicle um, to kind of fill the needs of having four kids, be a fun, you know, off-roader kind of dad vehicle. Like I'm not a minivan guy. I won't. I, I won't buy a minivan. That's an absolute no for myself. I will not own a minivan. Um, I had to have a vehicle that fit that bill. Now, what I did at that time was I went and I looked at several Toyota Sequoias. And every single Toyota Sequoia was posted for five, six, seven, eight, nine thousand dollars with over 200,000 miles. I'm talking about well into the 200,000s. We're talking about 250, 260, nearly 300,000 miles for six thousand dollars. And you might say, you know what? Yeah, Tim, but it's a Toyota. That's true. But the name of this game was to find something reliable that would get me back and forth to work. Uh, get me, you know, haul the kids and, you know, kind of fulfill all my needs. So that, that going into that with that, those type of miles and stuff like that, I knew that there would be things that, I, that were going to, you know, be needed on those Sequoias because otherwise people typically would not sell the Sequoia if it was a good running vehicle. Like, why would you sell your Toyota Sequoia if it was something that was in good running order? You really wouldn't need to. So going into these um, negotiations with those vehicles, none of them really ticked all the boxes. Some of them were close, but we couldn't come to an agreement as far as pricing goes because I just didn't see the Toyota, you know, 2001, 2002 Toyota Sequoia as a 6,000 vehicle with over 200,000 miles. It just, it just didn't work in my head. You know, the numbers didn't work in my head. So I went back to the drawing board after getting rid of my forerunner and kind of in a bit of a bind um, as far as having a family hauler went, I still had my, my personal vehicle, you know, my daily driver. I still had my, you know, my street car and everything like that, but I was missing the family hauler. And then my wife had tuned me into the LR3. Now I was not aware that the LR3 was even a thing at the time. I personally was looking at like the Disco 2s and stuff like that, but I didn't know that they made these. I didn't know that they switched the name over to LR3. We were driving down the freeway one day and we had seen one of these things uh, just driving down the freeway and you know my wife fell in love with it and she was like, oh babe, it's got a third row. Like that's, that's it right there. So I'm like, okay, well that thing's gotta be like 10 or 15 grand right there. You know, fairly good looking SUV, it's a Land Rover. I was sorely mistaken, but I'm glad that they come in at the price point that they do because these are extremely underrated and undervalued. This thing will get you anywhere that you need to go in a heartbeat. I've had no, and you know, knock on wood, but I've had no engine or transmission problems. I've changed the oil. I've, you know, changed the transmission fluid. And yes, the pan, you can call the transmission, you know, uh, pan leak and a transmission if you, if you issue if you like. But with over 200,000 miles, I don't think that that's out of the question that the transmission pan would have a slight seep. That, you know, that's, I don't think that's out of the question, but the transmission shifts solidly. The engine oil uh, no longer leaks after I replace that seal. Um, there are no other major issues that have arose on this thing with over 200,000 miles on it. And um, so that being the case, um, what, why, why would I recommend this over a Sequoia? Well, number one is going to be your price. If you are looking for a three or four thousand dollar vehicle that has the luxury um, that the Sequoia does not, uh, this is going to be your choice. This is closer to like the GX 470, 
um, you know, and the LX and luxury, the Lexus LX 470 and the GX 470, this is closer to those in luxury. This is what those were targeted at. But when you go to buy those vehicles, you're looking at anywhere from $7,000 for one with high mileage upwards to 15. And even I've seen some at 20, over $20,000. So coming in at a price point, um, well worth, uh, what this thing will give you for that, um, for the amount of luxury, for the amount of, um, you know, uh, for the amount of luxury, for the amount that you're able to customize and, you know, what you're able to do to these vehicles and what the vehicle is able to do for you. I think this is an awesome price point. And I think that this is something that, um, you know, these are going to start going up in value. I don't see why not. If, if they're reliable, at least this one, the 4.4 V8 has been dead reliable. I can't speak to the V6 because I haven't had those, but I have seen on the forums some issues that can arise with these LR3s. But um, if you do opt to go with the V8, know that personally I've had no major issues with these vehicles. They've been great. It's been amazing, you know, two years of ownership and, you know, a few things that I've had to put into it. The compressor had went out by itself. Um, however, the air suspension that was replaced, that was something that I chose to do as a preventative maintenance um, for the vehicle. So if you're looking at getting something that fits the bill for luxury, that fits the bill for, you know, something that you plan to take maybe some light trails and, you know, over some slight rocks or divots or anything like that, um, you know, great in snow, great in gravel, great in sand. Um, this is it. This is this is my choice right here. And if I had to choose right now between the 0102 Sequoia and this, I would definitely choose this um, just because of how uh, I will say modular these are. Not to say the Toyota Sequoia is any less module, modular, but um, for the amount that you're going to pay for this and put into this versus the amount that you'd pay and put into a Toyota Sequoia or like say a Porsche uh, Cayenne or something like that or uh, Volkswagen Tiguan or something like that. Any of those vehicles that are kind of quirky that you can still off-road with, um, I would still choose this one. This is, you know, something that, you know, kind of has a history to it too. You know, if you look at, you know, the Camel Trophy uh, discos and stuff like that, that was, you know, a real um, inspiration to, um, to keep working um, with this vehicle, you know, putting the lift on it, the snorkel and stuff like that. Soon the uh, other plans that I have uh, to come to fruition with this thing. What are the other plans that I have for the LR3? Well, that is a question that is hard to answer. And why I say that is because I've done most of the things that I wanted to do to the LR3, but there's still some things left over. I want to put a roof rack on the vehicle, but in the sake of not needing it that often, um, that will probably be one of the last things to go on. Um, I want to do a front bumper on this thing. Again, for the amount of time that I'm probably going to use the, uh, you know, the front bumper, which, you know, I'm talking about a, uh, a steel bumper with like a, a crash bar or stinger on it or something like that. For the amount of time that I'm going to use that, uh, for it to wait on the vehicle and give it worse gas mileage, it's not really something that I need and that will also be one of the last things that I put on. However, um, I am planning on putting sliders on this thing because some of the small rocks can come up and kind of ding some of this plastic. This one actually fell off right here and I had to reattach it with a little bit of glue um, after you know a small trip. Um, the main next modification for the LR3 is definitely gonna be a rear mount uh you know tire swing out because i do have a spare for this they mounted the tire in a terrible location on these you know just like every other uh vehicle they mount them underneath there and i've since taken my spare off because i don't really need it there but um you know that being said this is a good vehicle uh, to have a, a tire swing out on um, for easy access to the spare and stuff like that. So that is going to be probably the next thing that I do is gonna be the tire swing out. Then we're gonna do the sliders. And then after some time, we're probably gonna do the roof rack and the front bumper on this thing. So those are the plans that I have for the LR3. Now, 
I think after I do those two exterior mods, I think I'm going to turn to the interior on this thing. I've seen a few of the kind of newer luxury cars where they have the diamond stitching and stuff like that. Some of the, some of the you know, newer vehicles that have come out and they have, um, you know, like the new Genesis GV70 Coupe. That interior is absolutely awesome. If you're looking at that, if you're looking at like a Lamborghini Urus, something uh, a little bit more, with a little bit more flair on it. So I think what I'll do is I'll take this down after doing those two exterior mods and take care of the interior. I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do some type of crazy uh, luxury interior. I'm gonna do something uh, Alcantara with, you know, stitching and stuff like that on it um, and uh, have some other mods kind of done to the interior to get that taken care of. Um, and tied together but again this is off kind of you know in the future um, so guys what I think uh, is this a great vehicle for the price or even overall as far as budget SUVs go I think this is the best one over you know Toyota's over you know Lexus over uh, Honda uh, Porsche Volkswagen you name it I think this was the best choice that I could have made at the time um, uh, as far as the budget goes, I would definitely recommend getting one of these things if you're looking for a family hauler, but something that uh, needs to be budget friendly, something that needs to be, you know, that you can take off roading and stuff like that. Because otherwise, why not just get the minivan? Why not just stick with something that's, you know, a little bit more reliable and still a kid hauler? But if you need something that's going to take you off road, that's going to get you where you need to go, I definitely would recommend the LR3. And uh, with that, I am going to wrap this video up. I'll see you in the next one.